uh, you know, I, I don't think it's, you know, we, we thought it would rally. I mean, it got oversold just like gold did. But I don't think the rally is going to last much longer. I think, I mean, what oil has been fighting thus far, it's not just a slowing global economy. It's been more excess supply. And that has come largely from the frackers in the United States, which are a bubble industry. Fracking is, is hailed as some great innovation. And, and it's a crock because without super low junk bond prices via the Fed, Without the stimulus that reignited the global economy and brought oil back up to 115 after it crashed to 32, we would have never had a fracking industry. They can't make it. They are high cost producers. They cannot compete with Saudi Arabia uh, and other low cost sources of oil. And Saudi Arabia is c- continuing to pump oil because they want to kill the frackers. So the frackers are done. They're dead. We've been saying this for the last two years. Their oil is not going to come back to 60, 80, 100 bucks where they can make money. When their wells run out, they're just not going to reinvest because they can't afford to because junk bonds now cost them 12 percent instead of 6 percent. And oil is probably not is probably going to be in a 10 to 60 dollar range for many, many years and averaging more in the kind of 30 ish area. And they just can't make money there. So so. uh, Oil, the next problem with oil is going to be, yes, some supply is going to increasingly disappear from these frackers, but global demand is going to fall much more rapidly. We see signs that we're going into a global recession again. I think by the summer, the stock market is going to be crashing again. I think by the end of this year, Europe is going to see major defaults in Italy and Greece again, and China bubble is just going to keep bursting. The big picture here, Daniel, is simple. Central banks and zero interest rate policies and 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 the greatest debt bubble around the world in history has created a bubble in everything. The greatest bubble, the most global, most pervasive, all assets, real estate, commodities, gold, stocks around the world. And this bubble is unraveling and central banks just keep pumping money in to try to keep what I call the orgasm going. Because bubbles are orgasms, and they look exactly like the Masters and Johnson's orgasm chart. I show this all the time in my presentation. I can throw the gold bubble up, the Nikkei bubble, the tech bubble, the the current S&P stock bubble, um, real estate, everything, and they all fit this orgasm chart. The thing is, bubbles don't correct. They don't have soft landings. They burst. When they finally run out of steam, they're so overdone that they can only collapse. And China is is the most feverish government sitting there plugging dike after dike. Oh, the stock market cracked 50%. Okay, well, then they buy their own stocks, you know. Then they pump up this and they do this and that. And they, they lower margin requirements. You know, their real estate bubble's bursting. That's how they got their stock bubble. Because they encourage stock speculation to try to take attention off the real estate bubble bursting. And then they got a stock bubble that's bursting. I mean, and, and then you know, when the stock bubble bursts, then Chinese real estate investors lose confidence in their economy. Yeah, this is just a giant effort for governments to act like, oh, we don't have a bubble and we can have a soft landing. There will be, and I repeat this and will stake my entire reputation and I will move to Australia and be a limo driver if I'm wrong about this. (laughs) We're going to see the biggest global bubble burst in history in the next four years. When all four of my most important long-term indicators that I've spent three decades honing, refining, and developing, these four all point down between mid-2014 and early 2020 for the same time. The only time that's happened was in the mid-70s when we had the biggest crash and crisis back then, and in the early 30s when we had the Great Depression and the biggest stock crash in history. There's only one way out of this bubble, and that is for it to burst. And so people simply have to get out of the way. Forget chasing a 4% yield on a bond. Just get zero. Get out of stocks. Get out of real estate that's not strategic to your life or business because all of this stuff's going to reset back to where it should be without all this endless debt and endless printed money and stimulus and zero interest rates policies, which always debt bubbles 
And low interest rates set by governments will always create speculative bubbles, and those bubbles will always burst. If there was even one exception, Daniel, in history, I'd say there's a chance this won't happen. There are no exceptions. Bubbles burst. What what about the response to the bubbles bursting by the central planners and government? Let's take housing, for example. A house, you know, once this bubble bursts when in commodities, in, in housing prices, I mean, you got people can't afford mortgages now and builders are, you know, everything, essentially everything, the whole freaking world, as you're describing it, and I totally agree, is subsidized by easy money and debt. And now it's bursting. So what about the response? The central planners are going to keep pumping cash. What yeah. is what is going to stop them from keeping these things from either bursting or at least them being able to inflate them quickly again like they did in 2009 to today? Yeah, but you know, even though they <laughs> reinflated it quickly, we still had a 50-60% stock crash in real estate crash and crisis and banking crisis before they could turn it around. Now they've created a bit. What, what, what kills these central banks is their only solution to this debt and financial asset bubbles is to create more debt and more financial asset bubbles. How could that possibly be the solution? Their Achilles heel is not that they will, they will keep printing money. They've gone to negative interest rates now, but look at Japan as an example. Not only after we stopped after we tapered off the QE, the only major country to do so, they tripled down and have been tr- printing money at three times the rate we did at our peak. And now they've gone to negative interest rates. And guess what will happen? Their stock market's going down again. They're in recession again. It doesn't work at some point. You can't keep taking more heroin without falling down, bashing your head, and there's only two places you can end up if you keep taking more and more of a drug to feel better, not come down off the bubble in the high. You either go to detox or you die. There are only two solutions to that. So detox is a debt deleveraging like we saw happening in late 2008 before central banks just says we will not tolerate this and we'll just, for every dollar a bank loses or every dollar the stock market falls, we'll just put another dollar in. We're just going to pretend like it never happened. I mean, this this is the most irresponsible, unrealistic monetary policies in all of history, with the exception of the Mississippi and South Sea bubbles in the early 1700s. And that was the biggest stock crash ever. These, that, those stock markets in Europe went down 99%, not 89% in the Great Depression or 70% in the 70s, 99%. Because it was a government finance bubble governments the british and french governments had fought wars for years ran up huge debts and the only way for them to pay off those debts were to sell their ownerships and the trading companies in england and the ownership of france of swamp land in america and mississippi and louisiana and stuff to the public worthless stuff to the public and finance it with free money so they created a bubble and what did the bubble do it burst Harry, because of the demand for gold during a crisis, um, regardless of what the data shows, it's um, whether it's been a good thing or bad thing for gold and deflation or inflation, just knowing that the people, the masses will likely buy gold and have been buying gold. Um, gold is now at 52 week highs. The, the gold mining shares specifically are up more than 100%. Um, is it possible? Um, you know, I know you've looked at the data where the commodities are collapsing, but gold specifically is almost separated from those commodities as a money. It's not money. And gold correlates with one thing, inflation. Inflation's been going down since 1980. And I mean, you remember gold crashed in the early 80s and didn't turn around until 2001. People have been buying gold, have been crucified, even though all the people like me that say, hey, hey, we got a debt bubble and it's going to burst. They tell you to buy gold. People have been buying gold for years and been getting their asses handed to them. Gold is rallying. I've been calling for months and months. I said gold has been crucified. It's been oversold down at 1,050, 1,100. It's going to bounce. It's going to take a healthy bear market bounce. But but mark my words, bear market. I think gold goes to 1,400 here, give or take, and then falls by mid to late 2017 to 700 bucks where it was in 2008 when it crashed 
during the crisis. The last time we had a worldwide financial crisis and banks were melting down and all this sort of stuff, gold was not the safe haven. It went running for mommy. Gold went down 33% in four or five months in late 2008. Silver went down 50%. The U.S. dollar that all these gold bugs say are is going to fall to zero went up 27%. That's the safe haven. U.S. dollars done nothing but go up most of the time since the crisis started and, and the recession started in early 2008. It went up in the crisis and it continued to go up sooner or later, even when all the money printing happening and now the money printing's failing. I think the dollar is the best place to be until it resets and gets in parity with other currencies. The people don't realize the dollar went down 58% in the boom. 58%, which is a huge depreciation for a currency. Now it's just basically rebalancing. The dollar goes up another 20, 30%. I'll feel like it's fairly valued again, long-term, and then I will no longer be a dollar bull. But right now, I do not want gold and I want the US dollar. Gold goes to $1,400. We got people out in late April when silver peaked. The day silver peaked at 48 bucks. Gold peaked a little higher in September, but we got people out of gold and silver right there at the, near the top. And we're telling people this bounce here is the last chance to get out of gold. It is, it is a de- an inflation hedge and a beautiful one, the best in history. It is not going to do well in deflation, and it is not – the crisis metal gold correlates with inflation not crisis if it was a crisis hedge then why did it go down in late 2008 when we had the worst financial crisis since the great depression it's not a crisis hedge we confuse crisis with inflation most crises we've had including the oil embargo of the 70s and every war in history have been inflationary crises that's when gold goes up this is not an inflationary crisis in fact Central banks are purposely creating money for one reason, and that's to keep deflation at bay. Without $12 trillion of money printing around the world, we would have already seen deflation like the Great Depression. And in deflation, every financial asset except the strongest currencies and the strongest sovereign bonds goes down. Junk bonds go down. Stocks go down. Commodities go down. And yes, gold go down, goes down. Harry, Harry, does your do your models um, take into account the heavy, heavy involvement in central banks, both that is happening publicly and and a lot of manipulation? I mean, I'm I'm not going to get specifically into into uh, a commodity, but uh, let's let's say you know gold, the 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 market indexes anything. I mean, we I think I mean and I, and. You know, please correct me if you disagree, um, but I see constant manipulation in the precious metals, in the Dow Jones. Do your models account for all the manipulation that's going on that sometimes it's keeping things priced higher? And for like gold, in my opinion, it's keeping it priced lower. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> that's something our models can tell you when people are going to spend money, when geopolitical environment is going to be positive or favorable, when innovation is going to add productivity and growth to the economy, when booms and busts are going to tend to happen. we we got four incredible models for predicting the fundamentals of the economy. Our models can't predict the insanity of central banks. All we can do is, is subjectively understand that we know where the economy would have been and should have been without all this manipulation. And you're right, they have manipulated everything. Central, my, my two tenets are central banks have hijacked free market capitalism, totally set the markets, totally taken over the markets, no more free markets. They decide what short-term, long-term interest rates, they set them at zero adjusted for inflation, and that inflates every other financial asset because everything's priced against the treasury bond, everything. And, and yes, that, that suppresses gold and all this sort of stuff, but they have manipulated that and in special interest have hijacked democracy. We don't have democracy anymore. You know, 158 families have financed half of the primary election money and the Koch brothers single-handedly vetoed Mitt Romney. I'm not for or against Mitt Romney. I'm just saying, here's a credible guy that could have run and they just said, sorry, we don't like Mitt. He's out. Two guys, two assholes in some state somewhere in Texas. This, 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 we don't have the two things that made us rich. 
free market capitalism married democracy. Harry met Sally in the late 1700s. We've had the greatest long-term bull market in the economy and stocks around the world ever since. And now we're killing the golden goose with all this market manipulation because central banks and governments don't want to admit that they created a giant bubble and now they don't want to admit and they don't want to deleverage and they don't want it to happen on their watch. So they just keep printing money and destroying the whole market fundamentals. So no, we can't predict that. We can just subjectively say all they're doing, they're not changing the fundamentals. They're just bubbling up. They're taking drugs to feel better, financial drugs and financial enhancing performance drugs, just like heroin or crack or cocaine or anything you want to say, or drinking 20 cups of coffee a day. That's all they're doing. They're stimulating the system beyond its capacity when it's already been overstimulated for 30 years now, uh, debt growing at two and a half times GDP in the United States, three and a half times in China. I mean, the, the, you can't do that. It is like taking cocaine. Harry, and cocaine only ends up more and more to create less and less until you pass out and go to detox or die. Only two ways out of a, an, an addiction like this. Harry, I, I want to um, close this interview out with a little optimism. So one, when is this behind us? And two, this parabolic move we're seeing in technology where you've got um, I mean, smart cars, cars that drive themselves. You've got Domino's delivering pizza with machines. There are, there are all kinds of things that are making our lives incredible. Uh, what, when is this behind us? And what are your thoughts on this parabolic move of technology that we're seeing? I mean, is, is humanity about to see the current system collapse, but the new system could be so much better with the technology? Okay, this is going to be hard to swallow, okay? Our, my fourth indicator, the last one over 30 years that I added is an innovation cycle every 45 years. That innovation cycle is not, does, not, does not come because things are invented or there's breakthroughs in technology because breakthroughs only hit the 0.1% or the 1% at first and the 10% at most, the niche markets like automobiles in the early 1900s. It's when these major technologies move mainstream into the business and consumer economy that they have the biggest impacts. We've already seen that with the information revolution and the internet. Moore's law is retreating rapidly. <clears throat> you know, semiconductors have doubled in capacity, you know, every yes. two years or something for decades. It is ending. The internet, I don't care about Facebook. I'm not on Facebook. It's just fun. I don't care about driverless cars because I'd rather drive my car. These things are nice, but they're not like Google. They're not like email. They're not like texting. Those things changed my business. I used to have three full-time research assistants to do my research. You know how many I have now? I use half of one, and my partner uses the other half. Half because of Google and email. And I can write stuff and ship it around the world and write newsletters and blah, 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 and edit with people around the world and, 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 and do uh, presentations uh, on Skype around the world without having to travel to Australia anymore and South Korea and Europe. I mean, these things are already done. So we've seen the best. And this cycle says for the next two decades, yeah, it's not like innovation is going to stop. We're, there's always innovation. But the mainstreaming of the next technology revolution and nanotechnology and biotech and robotics. You know how slow robotics is coming along? Everybody says robotics are going to change the world. Ro robots can't even walk 10 feet without stumbling <laughs> after all this innovation. Those are the innovations of the future. Those are not even hardly in niche markets, and they're the less mainstream, and they won't be so till the 2030. So, yes, innovation is going to improve stuff, Facebook, social media, but social media – I don't think it's going to change the economy like like Google and email did. Yeah. Now, now, as far as the the economy itself, the debt crisis. I mean, is this behind us by twenty twenty? Yeah, I, I'd say we're going to see the worst by two thousand twenty to twenty two, and I, and I actually think by the end of next year, by late two thousand seventeen, we're going to see the largest part of the stock crash around the world. Um, and real estate will take longer to sort out. But I think you're going to see the worst of it. it it's kind of like you got to remember when 
every once a generation, when, when a generation stops spending simply because they age past their family cycle and start to save for retirement and, and downsize and do all the stuff that older people naturally do, you don't just see one recession. We saw several recessions between the late 60s and the early 80s. We saw several in their 30s and early 40s, and we saw a number of stock crashes, but almost all the damage was done between 30 and 32. Almost all the damage was done between 73 and 74. I think we're going to see that in 2016 and 17, that the, the Dow I'm projecting will hit 5,500 to 6,000 by the late 2017, just in the next, say, year and a half or so. And that'll be most of the damage. Uh, Then it'll rally and there'll be some aftershocks into 2020. My four cycles point down into early 2020 and then they start one after another to turn up. So I think the worst will be by early 2020, but I think the worst of that will be by the end of 2017. If you can get over the next two years and protect your assets and get out of stocks, get out of junk bonds, get out of gold on this rally and get out of real estate that's not really strategic. I, I, I only own one piece of real estate and it's on an island in the Caribbean because it's my getaway and it's a unique place when things get really bad. I don't own anything. I don't own the house I'm living in um, because I think real estate's just going to keep going down.